Welcome to Wicked Week here at Darkcast Network. I am your host, Gina, from the Weird True Crime Podcast, and I will be your host this week. Spooky season is upon us, and it is by far one of Darkcast Network's favorite seasons. Today is Freaky Friday Hauntings, so grab your munchies and something to cuddle with while some of our shows tell you blood-curdling stories of ghostly happenings. Hey, hey, this is Autumn from Autumn's Oddities Podcast, proud member of Darkcast Network. Please enjoy this tale of the ghosts of Edinburgh Castle. Known as the most haunted place in Scotland, Edinburgh Castle has had reports of ghosts and paranormal activity going back hundreds of years. There have been thousands of claims by visitors and staff members, including apparitions, feelings of being touched and pulled, also feelings of being watched, shadowy figures, mists, mists, green lights, sudden temperature drops, the usual stuff, and people suddenly becoming just overcome by emotions. The most common experience is the sighting of apparitions. The sighting of an older man in a leather apron has been seen, as well as a terrifying little headless drummer boy, and of course, the Grey Lady or Janet Douglas. Other reports include a poltergeist in the castle dungeon and a regular sighting of ghost dogs in the castle's dog cemetery, the most notable being Grey Friars Bobby. The legend of the little drummer boy goes back to 1650 when his headless ghost was spotted playing an old Scottish war tune along the battlements. His spirit appeared when Oliver Cromwell's men were laying siege to the castle, therefore giving credence to the belief that the boy appears when the castle is under attack. He's just trying to defend his sweet castle. Nobody knows who this apparition could be, but anyone living today hasn't witnessed this phenomenon, as Edinburgh Castle hasn't been under threat since the Jacobite Uprising in 1745. You're getting a history lesson along with the scary story. Several centuries ago, a secret network of tunnels was discovered underneath Royal Mile that went from the castle towards Holyrood Place. To find out where they lead, the brave souls of the time sent a young piper boy to search the tunnels for them. He set about playing his bagpipes, and the people above followed the sound. The sound was clear for a time until the bagpipes abruptly stopped near Tronkirk on Royal Mile. Several search parties were sent down to locate the boy, but the poor piper was nowhere to be found. Disturbed by the boy's disappearance, the city council ordered that the tunnels be sealed, never to be reopened. Since his disappearance, the little boy playing his bagpipes can be heard from underneath the Royal Mile. Visitors still report this phenomenon to this day. The story of Janet, or the Grey Lady, is a tragic one. Caught in the middle of a family feud, she would ultimately be executed by King James V of Scotland. She was related to her brother was Archibald Douglas, the sixth Earl of Angus, who was the king's stepfather and very, very much hated by the king. And with good reason, he imprisoned him as a young boy. Yeah, I I would hold a grudge, too, I think. (laughs) James held a grudge, he did, against Archibald and all the Douglas family. And in 1537, Janet was convicted of trying to poison James, and she was also accused of witchcraft. However, such evidence was very difficult to prove or, you know, obtain in any way. So James had her servants and friends tortured until they gave him the evidence that he needed. Janet was subsequently convicted and burned at the stake outside Edinburgh Castle on July 17th, 1537, with her young son forced to watch. Shortly after her gruesome death, people witnessed the Grey Lady walking throughout the castle weeping i can imagine there has been a defensive fort on the site of edinburgh castle since the iron age and in 638 a.d it served as a defensive stronghold for the celtic speaking natives when the when the germanic forces attacked and claimed the settlement the germanics changed its name from din Eiden to edinburgh for the first time then in 1296 god these are a long time ago, aren't they? Uh, it was overthrown by Edward I of the Scots and then again by Robert Bruce, her, who called for it to be burned to the ground. It was rebuilt by and became home to Mary, Queen of Scots, until she was exiled to England, 
a lot of exiles, a lot of executions. I can see why it's haunted. After which the castle was then partially destroyed by the English and it was then rebuilt again in 1574. James VII of Scotland lost his throne to William of Orange in 1688, and the Jacobite uprisings aside in the 18th century, it has remained undamaged ever since, so that would account for why the little headless drummer boy has not been seen again. If you would like to see the ghosts, the castle still exists, it offers tours, and I would wager you will probably see a ghost since there have quite literally been thousands of apparition sightings. It's not just like a feeling or a mist, although people have witnessed that as well, but apparently like you have a really good shot of seeing an actual ghost if you visit Edinburgh Castle. It's a bucket list trip for me. Uh, Let's all organize one. Let's do it together, and we can all witness for ourselves the ghosts of Edinburgh Castle. Thank you for listening. And remember, if it's creepy and weird, you'll find it here. Hey, everybody. I'm Josh. And I'm Jamie. And we're from the Paranormal Peeps podcast. And we have a fun story for you guys. And it's kind of what everybody has, like the the story, right? I didn't believe in ghosts until... This happened. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a story and it's from uh, Alexandra uh, Charatin. And it was in the Road Culture magazine. And it says, I did not believe in ghosts until I spent a night alone at the notoriously haunted Stanley Hotel. But this isn't the Stanley Hotel that you're thinking of in Colorado. It is not. It is not. This is another Stanley Hotel. Which I had no idea until I read this article. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> so this this Stanley Hotel is actually in upstate New York. Okay. So it goes, as I'm driving the winding road to the Stanley Hotel, which sits in the foothills of the Shawagunk mountains in upstate new york i passed several abandoned motels two active correctional facilities and the witch's hole state forest if i didn't already have a reservation i might have been concerned when i pulled up to the hotel at dusk at first glance the three-story white clabbered structure and most of a main street in the tiny hamlet of napanock looks abandoned i'm checking in to this allegedly haunted hotel in the search of ghosts and i don't have to wait long to find one A freshly painted sign on the porch that reads, Welcome to the Stanley Hotel, prominently features a ghost. His arms are crossed, but he's smiling. (laughs) In contrast to the dilapidated exterior, the inside of the hotel is bustling. Two couples check in ahead of me, and when I step up to the counter, manager Kim uh, Vital asks, How many people are in my party? Just me, I say. A woman behind me gasps. You're brave, she says. The Stanley Hotel has more than embraced its spooky reputation. Now officially called the Haunted Stanley Hotel, they offer private investigations, provide a list of the most haunted rooms, and share evidence in the form of videos and electronic voice phenomenon, EVP recordings. A stained glass window above the entrance declares, the spirits are in. In addition to a continental breakfast, my overnight stay includes a five-hour staff-led paranormal investigation from 8 p.m. to 1 a.m., followed by free time to investigate at my leisure. They provide equipment, flashlights, K2 meters, vibration balls, temperature sensors, frequency scanners, and encourage guests to bring their own. They have a lot of stuff. That's actually kind of nice. There are a few ground rules, but they're simple. No weapons or alcohol are allowed on the premise. Guests should talk in a normal voice. Whispering may be mistaken for an EVP. Take photos with flash and in threes and record everything. It's okay to be skeptic and a non-believer. But I ask that you keep an open mind, Vital says. The hotel is fully booked for the night and for the rest of October, so we split into groups of three. I've booked Maddie's room, located in the former Bordello area on the second floor. And I'm the only guest flying solo. My room is part of the active investigation area, meaning that my door must remain open until 1 a.m. The rooms are cozy and eclectic. In fact, the scariest thing at the Stanley Hotel might just be the overload of contrasting pattern. So Vital and the hotel's new owner, Kelly Hammerling, conducted ghost investigations on the property for years before it became their full-time jobs. When people suggest that the pair is being paid to perpetuate the hotel's haunted reputation, Vital tells them, I was here for eight years and I didn't get a dime. Kelly and I did it every weekend because we loved it and had the passion for it, for the history and the spirits and what goes on behind these doors. In 1845, Thomas Rich erected his eponymous Rich Hotel on the Napa Knox Main Street. 
The hotel changed owners several times through the years, and in 1895, a fire destroyed the entire original structure. The hotel was quickly rebuilt and reopened to guests just a few months later. James Shanley, an Irish immigrant, purchased the hotel in 1906 and added the barn-like addition onto the back. It initially housed a barber shop and later functioned as a gentleman's quarters for the second floor bordello. James married Beatrice Rowley at the hotel in 1910, and the Shanleys, who had ties to the Irish Mafia, were well known and respected in New York City, just two hours south of Napanock. Hammerling says that when Shanley descendants visited the hotel recently, they told her Times Square was almost named Shanley Square, and claimed that the Gangs of New York is loosely based on their family. Beatrice was good friends with Eleanor Roosevelt and Thomas Edison stayed at the hotel. When the Shanleys got into trouble serving alcohol during Prohibition, the Roosevelts helped clear their name. Today, the hotel has a Roosevelt room in their honor. The Shanleys were known for their elaborate parties, but there was tragedy too. The couple had three children, but none of them survived longer than a few months. Rosie, the three-year-old daughter of the Shanley Hotel's resident, Barber, fell down a nearby well and died. A local preacher's daughter, Helen, was only nine years old when she was lured with the promise of a lollipop to a nearby swamp and murdered by Alfred Volkman, the son of a butcher. Volkman spent time in Hudson Valley's notorious Sing Sing prison before he was executed. Both spirits are reportedly still frequent guests at the Shanley. When Helen asked for a a pink dress, Hammerlin obliged. It currently hangs in the room in which Beatrice's sister, Esther, died. Over the years, Hammerling says she has made contact with more than 30 different spirits. They come and go, she says. We may hear from some for four or five days straight and then not hear from them for weeks. We don't know why. We don't know where they go. If we knew, then we'd be dead. <laughs> we'll know someday, but just not for a while. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. So we get into a couple of the hauntings. There's a man who whistles, several children, and even a ghost cat named Sweet Thing. Recently, a guest asked Frank how he died, and according to Vital, he replied, a gunshot in the pub. Hammerling says that Frank has strangled her twice, and when she told the group, he replied, via EVP, you liked it. That's the kind of sense of humor Frank has, Hammerling says. Vital and Hammerling clearly appreciate all of their guests, both physical and metaphysical, and are humble about the chain of command. This is an actual haunted hotel, and we respect our spirits, Vital says. This isn't our home, this is their home. The hotel spirits are known for producing some very clear EVPs, even if it's not always obvious during the nightly ghost hunts. Searching for spirits can be hit or miss, and there's no money-back guarantee. They can be there talking to us right now, and we wouldn't know until we play back the recording, Hammerling says. We don't know why some nights we have a tremendous amount of activity, and some nights it's quiet. After a particular quiet stretch, Vitel asks if there's a skeptic in our group. I stay silent, but later I ask her why the presence of a skeptic may negatively affect a hunt's outcome. The spirits just won't bother, she says. But don't they want to prove they exist, I ask? Takes a lot of energy to contact us, Vital says. They don't want to waste their time. Ghosts have nothing to prove. Mm, That is true. It is true. They don't have to prove that they exist. Hammerling encourages us to engage with, but not provoke the spirits. You want them to think, wow, these people are great. Let's take our time and energy to actually talk to these people, she says. So we seem to have the most luck with a tablet running the Phasm Box app, which scans through several pre-recorded radio stations in search of voices. Although Hammerling cautions that not everything you hear through the Phasm Box is a paranormal, she urges us to listen for intelligent responses to specific questions. What can be considered intelligent, like most things during the night, is up for interpretation. Although ghost hunting is usually done at night, the spirits are there here in the daytime, Hammerling says. It doesn't matter what time of day it is, but the dark lets you experience them more fully. Yeah, because the rest of the world, well, the rest of the area is quiet. There's not a lot of traffic. People are usually settling down. And this is why we ghost hunt at night. Exactly. So we're sitting in a circle and someone across from me gets full body chills twice. But other groups report even more activity including hearing Sweet Thing, who died of natural causes in Claire's room, meow several times. We asked Joe questions about his history with the Mafia. How many people have you killed? What's your weapon of choice? And finally, why don't you like women, Joe? With no responses, at one point Hammerling thinks you hear someone say, Hi, Karen. But there's no Karen in our group. Maybe we're saying overprivileged women. (laughs) Quit being a Karen. 
I don't think that they're really um, familiar with today's term of hearing. <laughs> they so might. <laughs> they might not. Shortly after Hamling and her husband purchased the hotel, he was cutting wood in broad daylight when he yelled for his wife. He wouldn't say why he called my name. I thought he cut himself, Hamerling says. But three weeks and three drinks later, he admitted that he had been spooked by the sight of a mysterious woman who appeared next to him. And he's a skeptic, or was a skeptic, I should say, Hammerling says. In the hotel's great room, stacks of composition notebooks contain the notes from previous guests. Had a lovely New Year's Eve in Anna's room, Anna and Tim write. Awakened at dawn by the scratching at the window, a friendly squirrel or question mark. Another page contains a sketch of one of the hotel's beds. An arrow points to the figure looming nearby the guest, n- nearby, and the guest writes, She is always watching. Whether someone is watching or not, when 1 a.m. rolls around, I am ready for bed. I slide under the covers, close my eyes, and fall asleep quickly. Around 2.30 a.m., however, I jolt awake. My heart is racing, and my body is racked with chills. I switch on the light and pile on more covers, but my teeth keep chattering uncontrollably. I take deep breaths and eventually fall back into a fitful sleep, but the light stays on until morning. We've done that a couple times. Yes, we have. Where we've turned on the light and left it on all night until morning. Yep, getting uh, ice cold breath in your face in the middle of the night. Yep. That'll do it. That'll do it. But I think, honestly, the the, the story brings out some really good points about not provoking, being mm-hmm. being respectful. Yep. The one Not going on a ghost hunt inebriated in any way. Exactly. Not, not to mention it's just dangerous trying to walk around in the dark. I mean, in you know, sober and trying to do it in a drunk would be like hazardous. Well, not only that, but you leave yourself really open and vulnerable. Yeah, and that's never that's never good. Never good. So honestly, I highly recommend if anyone wants to go stay at this hotel, it is open and they do take uh, they do take reservations and you can go check them out. Yeah, and if any of our listeners have stayed at this hotel or have seen it, known about it, and have any extra information? Let us know. Let us know. Share. And as always, stay ghosty, my peeps. My name is Brenda, and I'm the creator and host of the podcast Horrifying History. Are you into the dark side of history? Horrifying History tells you about the side of history that people don't normally talk about. We tell the tale of haunted places, infamous true crimes, the paranormal, unsolved mysteries, and then we look to history to see where the truth actually lies. Do you know what our listeners ask me the most? What they want to know is, do I believe in ghosts? I understand why I'm asked this. After all, I do tell spooky stories every Wednesday. But since I do not tell people what they should believe in or not, many are not so sure where I personally sit concerning this debate. So today is the day I come clean to you all. I'm a believer. It would be hard for anyone to find a person who worked in frontline healthcare like I have who doesn't believe in some sort of continuation after death. But let's just say, my spooky friends, I have seen some very strange things. But my belief in spirits did not come from my chosen career. It actually came when I was very young, but at the time I had no understanding of what I saw. It wasn't until I became older that I came to understand what I saw one summer day when I was three years old, and that is where our story starts today. I grew up on a farm on the northeastern side of the province of Alberta in Canada. As an adult, I see my childhood as one of two ways, full of blessings and full of danger. As a kid, I was allowed to run and play as far as my eye could see. Animals were my best friends, and when I hit the edge of my parents' farm, I could just keep walking and hit my parental grandparents' house. They lived nearby, and my grandparents' home was my second home. Now, as for the danger, this is something that every single kid who grew up on a farm understands as an adult. There are sharp and pointy things everywhere, poisonous chemicals, wild animals, and very little direct parental supervision. This ruled our lives alongside hard work. Now, personally, I have no idea how I survived childhood, and the story I'm about to tell you should have ended me, but instead, it put me on a lifelong path to try to learn more of what happens after we die. So as I said, our tale starts when I was three years old. For those of you who were not raised on a farm, children are free labor. It doesn't matter how old or young you are, you are expected to help out. So on the day in question, my dad was in the middle of breaking new land, So just so you all know what this consists of. 
Machinery is used to rip out any of the trees that are standing. Then comes the process of removing any tree roots and rocks that could cause damage to future farm equipment. You have to pick those roots and rocks. This is back-breaking work, even for a three-year-old. Roots need to be cut out by hand, but my dad gave me my very first little hatchet and a pair of little work gloves and told me to go with my mom and siblings to pick some rocks and roots. It was the first time that I was included, so I was pretty excited to be part of the big kids club. So out that day we went to the fields. At the end of the day, I was honestly filthy, but pretty proud of myself. Then my dad told my brother and sister and I to jump into the bucket attached to the front of the tractor so we can travel home. For our farm kid, riding in the bucket of a tractor was our version of an amusement park. I happily jumped in, while I heard my dad tell my older brother and sister to watch me. But let's be honest here, my spooky friends. If you had smaller brothers or sisters, I'm pretty sure that your parents asked you to watch your siblings. We all know, though, that the older ones do not watch the younger ones as much as a parent may hope. So, as I climbed into that bucket, I knew that maybe I could get away with some stuff. You see, I had a plan in what my three-year-old brain thought was fabulous. When my dad would start driving the tractor, I would stand on top of a huge rock that he placed in that bucket. That way, I can see in all directions. I would be the queen of the farm. But as you guys probably guessed, this was an amazingly bad plan. Rocks don't have seat belts. So as this tractor started to move, I climbed on top that rock and quickly looked to the right. Yep, just as planned, my brother and sister were totally ignoring everything I was doing. I decided that this was my time to stand up. And as soon as I did, that tractor hit a bump. The next thing I remember seeing was the underside of the tractor's engine as I hit the ground. I was run over by the front left tire of the tractor, and then I saw the huge dual tires coming for me next. I turned my head to the left and the tractor skidded to a stop with those big tires stopping just as they touched my body. Then I saw my mom and dad at my side and let's just say they were totally freaking out. After all, they kind of just ran their kid over with a tractor. So after they started the poking and the prodding and asking if I was okay, I asked them a question. You see, as I hit the ground and was run over by the first tire, I saw a man standing behind the tractor. He looked exactly like my dad with a couple differences. My dad and I shared the same hair color, black, but this man's hair was snow white. My dad would always wear jeans and a flannel shirt. This guy was wearing pants that looked like they were from the 1940s. They were woolen with a sharp pleat in the front of the leg. He also wore suspenders and my dad never wore suspenders. This guy also wore a white ironed long sleeved shirt and my dad, he was all about the plaid. So I asked my parents, who's the man behind the tractor? My mom and dad then told me, nobody was there. What was I talking about? But I was insistent. There was a man there. So I started to tell my parents what he looked like. They promptly brought me to the hospital positive that I had an acquired brain injury. They also said that I would never ride in the bucket of a tractor again, and the horror of losing this privilege made me stop talking about the man behind the tractor. But I didn't forget him. I also knew what I saw that day was true, but I didn't bring it up to my parents. After all, would you want to be reminded about the day that you ran over your own child with a tractor? So as I started to get older, I thought about this man less and less. I finally came to the conclusion that this would just remain a mystery, and now I think that, well, maybe that wasn't the plan at all. One of my favorite places to play as a child was in an old house that was located in the same yard as my paternal grandparents' house. This was my place to hide out if I need to escape some chores or just to have some time for myself. It was a handmade log cabin that had a porch on the front of it. On that porch was a porch swing, which I would sit in for hours and just watch the day pass by. When I was about six years old, I went out to sit on that swing. I looked down and saw something shine from one of the small spaces that was between the planks of the boards. So I got down to take a look and found what I thought was a coin. It was oxidized and it had a picture of a man carrying a boy on his shoulder on one side. On the other side of this coin it said, I'm a Catholic, in case of emergency, call a priest. Now I thought this was hilarious and I couldn't help but think that, you know, I'd rather call an ambulance, but it was that very second that I knew that this coin would be my good luck charm. And it honestly was. 
For every quiz or school test that I did, that coin was in my pencil case. If I went on a trip, the coin was in my pocket. Every major life event, that coin was with me. It was with me one summer day when I was about eight years old. So I was walking through that same old house when I saw something in the back of a closet. It was a book and it had a snap closing it. And when I opened it up, I realized what I had was a book of photo negatives. So I took them up to my mom, who then took them to a professional to develop. When my mom came home with the pictures, I started to take a look at them, and this was when I immediately stopped in shock. There was a man in these photos, and that man was the man that was standing behind the tractor. Same hair, same clothes, and he looked just like my father. I looked towards my mom to get some sort of explanation behind this, and this is where I learned about my grandfather. Now, my father was actually named after his dad. For the tale today, we're going to call him Frank. Now, Frank met my father's mother when she was 16. There was a little bit of an age difference, but back then, that didn't matter. The two were smitten. So after courting, the two decided to get married and start their lives together on that very same farm that was attached to my parents' farm, my grandparents' farm. So Frank and Grandma farmed their lamb together and had four children. The first died at the age of six months from a childhood illness. The second became Frank Jr., and that was my dad. Frank, he and my grandmother had two more boys together before tragedy struck. One day, Frank felt like he was coming down with the flu, so he told my grandmother that he was going to go out and get some farm work done, since he was pretty sure he'd be sick for the next couple days. So after he came back home to have some lunch, Frank went outside to do what he did after every meal. He lit up a cigarette and sat on the porch swing of the house he shared with my grandmother to smoke it. The house in question was that abandoned house that stood behind my grandmother's, the very house that I spent my childhood playing in. While sitting on the very swing that I would spend hours on, Frank had a massive heart attack. He didn't survive and my dad lost his father at the age of nine years old. His body was discovered by my grandmother, and the entire family was devastated. The local community came to Frank's funeral, and my grandmother had him buried with a cowboy hat that he loved to wear. But there was one thing missing. You'll hear about that in a few minutes, but first, I had to tell you about some very big realizations I had in this moment. Now, the first one was that my grandfather, who I thought was directly related to me as my father's father, was not. So several days after this, I went to speak to my grandfather, Mike, about all of this. He was able to tell me another part of the story. So after the death of my grandfather, Frank, he heard about what happened through community gossip. Mike and his siblings grew up near my grandma, and they were all old school friends. So when he heard about how his friend was now a widow with three small boys, he and his brothers knew that they had to go and help her out. So they would all regularly go to my grandmother's house to help her farm the land. Now, I'm going to directly quote my grandfather Mike here and what he said next. After a couple years, I became the luckiest man in the world when your grandmother and I fell in love. Not only I gained my beautiful wife, but a whole family at once. There is no difference between the children that your grandmother and I had together and the ones she brought into our marriage. Your dad and all our kids are just that, all of my kids. You are no different than any other of our grandkids since we love you with all our hearts. Now, honestly, I still miss my grandfather, Mike, every single day of my life. Now, on to the second realization I had. It was that my parents both believed me the day I got run over by that tractor that my grandfather, Frank, came to visit. After they heard what I was telling them in the field that day, they knew what I was saying was true. I didn't know anything about Frank at that time, and I never saw a picture of him. But they both were not only freaked out that they ran over their kid, but that my dad's dead father came over to ensure that I was okay. Many of you likely think that this may have freaked me out a bit, but it didn't. It kind of made me feel pretty loved. After all, a man who was dead for years came back to see if I was okay. I felt like there was somebody protecting me, but I didn't actually realize how much until years later. So when I was about 18 years old, my sister told me that a local antique expert was coming into town. She said that I should take my lucky coin to find out what it is and solve that mystery. So I brought it to the store hosting that antique expert and he inspected it. He told me that it wasn't a coin, it was a pendant. 
he said that he could see the area to where a chain that held it to that pendant snapped. So St. Christopher was a martyr that was killed in the 3rd century, and the most famous legend about him is that one day he carried a child who was unknown to him across a river. As he carried the child, the child got heavier and heavier, and soon he was struggling. But St. Christopher was determined to help this child and got him to the side of the river safely. This is when the child revealed themselves to be Christ, and this is why St. Christopher is the patron saint for travelers. After hearing this tale, I decided to go get this St. Christopher pendant cleaned up and fixed to be in its original form. So when I went to pick it up, I was able to see it clearly that it was jewelry. So when I started looking for a chain to put it on, I quickly decided to put it on a thick silver rope chain. The jeweler, he questioned my choice, saying that that chain it kind of looked a bit masculine. I thanked him for his opinion, but for some reason, that chain looked like it belonged to the piece. I soon left the store with my new good luck pendant on a chain around my neck. So several weeks later, it was Christmas Day, and I was really excited to go see my father's mother. I hadn't seen my grandmother for a couple months at this time, and I really missed her. So when I walked into the house that day, the way she looked at me made me want to turn around and run away. She quickly opened her arms to me and then dropped him and stared at me in shock. She pointed directly to my chest and said, where did you get that? I looked down to see my pendant and I told her the story of what happened. This is when I was given the rest of the story. When my grandfather Frank fell to the ground off that porch swing, he was wearing that same pendant. He wore it every day, and on this day, the chain broke as he fell to the porch having the heart attack. After he passed away, my grandma searched the area around and under the deck for this pendant. She was able to find the chain, but not the pendant. Now she was heartbroken and felt, well, that's the end of the story. But she never expected that over 40 years later that she would just turn around and see this pendant on the neck of her granddaughter. She also never expected it to be what looked like on the exact same chain that Frank wore the pendant with. At this point, I was honestly in shock. So my grandma then quickly got up and she went to her bedroom. She pulled out that original chain, and it was a rope chain that was the same length and appeared to look like the one that I wore. I immediately took this off and I tried to give it back to grandma, and she refused it. And she said, this was clearly not meant for me, it was meant for you. Frank clearly wanted his granddaughter to wear it, so please always wear this with pride. So to this day, I wear this pendant every time I'm worried or stressed. I wear it when I travel, but I did make one change to this pendant. On this chain now sits the pendant with a gold ring. I received this ring after my grandmother died and it was her original wedding ring with Frank. So when I received it, I knew it had to go on the chain with Frank's pendant. That day was the first day that these two items had been together since August of 1947. If there's one thing that I do know is that my grandparents are with me always and that Frank has been watching over me my entire life, even when I do really stupid things like getting run over by a tractor. Thank you all for listening to the story of my grandparents. Now, if you want to hear more tales like this, you can subscribe to Horrifying History wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. To get even more spooky content, though, you should join us on Facebook at Horrifying History, on Instagram and threads at horrifying underscore history, or on Twitter at horrifying H-I-S-T-1. Hey, spooky friends. It's Aurora from Burnt Marshmallows, Cozy Mysteries. You may recognize my voice from Murder Murder News, but I have a new-ish podcast for those of you that really love whodunits and spooky campfire-style stories. In today's story, I have a ghost story for you called Home. Olivia's French bulldog Tater was the epitome of canine contentment, his jowls flapping gently in the wind as he hung his head out the car window. Olivia stole a glance at her furry companion and managed a weak smile. I'm glad one of us is excited for this drive, she said, her voice carrying a mixture of exhaustion and resignation. Driving through the familiar streets of Maplewood, Olivia was engulfed by a tidal wave of memories, each one a sharp pang of nostalgia and regret. The town held fragments of her past, fragments she had desperately tried to forget. 
Spotting the school, she remembered all the times her mother had forgotten to pick her up. She recalled the last glimpse of her father at the Waffle House, his face etched with sadness before he disappeared from her life. The death of her mother hadn't come as a surprise. Her mother had been struggling with alcohol use since Olivia was a child, seeking solace in a bottle as her life unraveled. And now, returning to clear out her late mother's house after her passing, it felt like stepping back into a nightmare she had once managed to escape. The house, a weathered structure from Olivia's childhood, loomed ahead. The grass in the yard had grown untamed, the once vibrant garden reduced to wild, overgrown chaos. On the porch, there was an old wooden chair, weathered by countless storms, marking her mother's favorite smoking corner. Despite the passage of years, Maplewood hadn't stood still. A rush of new families had flooded into town during the lockdowns, fleeing the nearby city in search of refuge and space. Their arrival had inflated property values, turning what was once a modest home into an unexpected windfall. Olivia tried to find solace in this fact, knowing that selling the house would at the very least bring some positive change. As Olivia put the car in park, a message popped up on her phone. It was her partner, Eric. He asked, How's the drive? How are you holding up? Olivia quickly typed back, Just got here, miss you already. She took a deep breath as Tater panted excitedly next to her. All right, I guess we got our work cut out for us. Olivia rolled her suitcase to the front door and found the key her mother had hidden under a cracked flower pot. Inside, the house carried the unmistakable scent of mustiness. Despite her mother's mental health struggles and alcoholism, it was surprisingly tidy. She set out a bowl of water for Tater and decided to start the daunting task of packing, beginning with her old room. Stepping into her childhood sanctuary, it was like entering a time capsule. Posters of Bikini Kill and Hole adorned the walls, faded relics from her teenage years. She couldn't help but giggle at the sight of her old closet, filled with an impressive amount of satin and silver attire from the 2000s. Just then, As Olivia sorted through the nostalgic clutter, she heard the front door slowly creak open and Tater darted out, barking furiously. Panic gripped Olivia and her eyes scanned the room for something that could be used as a makeshift weapon. Her gaze landed on a hand mirror resting on her old vanity and she slowly crept out into the living room. As she rounded the corner of the hallway, she saw a shadowy figure ahead. Her heart raced, but then she heard a familiar voice. Hello, is someone in here? It was Mrs. Jenkins, the neighbor. Relieved, Olivia said, Mrs. Jenkins, you nearly gave me a heart attack. Mrs. Jenkins startled, letting out a gasp. Olivia, I could say the same to you. What are you doing back in town? Olivia replied, I've decided to sell the house. I'm just here packing things up. Mrs. Jenkins, her face marked with concern, said, I'm sorry to hear about your mom. How are you holding up? Olivia replied with a sigh. I'm hanging in there. I'm just ready to put all this behind me. Mrs. Jenkins nodded sympathetically. Well, Olivia, you let me know if you need anything, all right? I'll let you get back to work. Feeling the pangs of hunger, Olivia wandered into the kitchen, hoping to find something edible. She swung open the fridge door, only to be met with a nauseating stench of rotting food. Among the grim contents, she spotted a box of Trader Joe's wine and thought to herself, why not? She poured herself a glass, took a sip of the wine, and started tossing spoiled food into the trash can. As Olivia worked her way through the kitchen, sipping wine, she suddenly heard Tater's low growl. She went to investigate and found him at the top of the stairs, staring down at the darkness. She called him back and with a sense of trepidation, turned on the light 
to investigate the basement. Carefully descending the creaking stairs, Olivia found herself in a dimly lit space. Her eyes settled on the washer and dryer and some clothes her mother had left hanging downstairs. There was an eerie stillness to the basement, broken only by the distant hum of the appliances. Suddenly, the overhead light flickered and then went out entirely. She quickly grabbed her phone and turned on the light to scan the basement, but nothing seemed out of place. Olivia made her way back upstairs. She closed and locked the basement door, telling herself Tater was just doing weird things dogs do. She then continued her assessment of the house, mentally calculating how many boxes she would need and what items might fetch a decent price in a garage sale. As she entered her mother's bedroom, Olivia found herself standing before the medicine cabinet. She couldn't help but linger over the array of prescription bottles. There were medications for blood pressure, diuretics for cirrhosis, and antipsychotics for schizophrenia. Olivia knew her mother had been diagnosed with schizophrenia later in life after she had started hearing voices around the house. She had been convinced the house was haunted, but Olivia had never experienced anything unusual in the house during her own childhood. After her trip to Lowe's, Olivia returned home, ready to dive back into packing away the old memories. The Trader Joe's wine became her reluctant companion as she sifted through the remnants of her past. The next morning, she awoke abruptly on the couch to the sound of her phone buzzing. Groggy and with a pounding headache, she answered, Hello? Eric's voice came through on the other end, tinged with concern. Hey, I thought you were going to call last night. Is everything okay? Olivia's mind raced as she tried to piece together last night's events. I'm sorry, I guess I must have had a little bit too much wine and fell asleep early. Eric's concern deepened. Are you sure you don't want me to head out there and help? Feeling embarrassed about her behavior, Olivia replied, Let's save those vacation days and do something fun after we get rid of this house. She hung up and headed to the bathroom, hoping a long, hot shower and some ibuprofen would help shake off this hangover. After finding a towel and pouring a glass of water, she went to the medicine cabinet to find pain meds. However, as she opened the mirrored cabinet, her blood ran cold. There, scrawled in an eerie handwriting, were the words, I'm still here. Panicked coursed through her as she looked around, searching under beds and in closets. Had someone broken into the house? The doors were all locked, and there was no sign of forced entry. Was it her hangover playing tricks on her? She took a deep breath and tried to calm herself. Maybe it was just her imagination, or perhaps her mother's presence lingering in the house. Determined to regain her composure, she decided to continue with her morning routine. The sooner she packed up and left this place behind, the better. As Olivia continued to make her way through the house, she found herself in her mother's closet. Among the colorful assortment of caftans that had long been her mother's uniform, something on a high shelf caught her eye. A set of journals, neatly lined up and forgotten, had remained hidden for years. Olivia had never known her mother to keep a journal, and the presence of these intimate writings felt like a breach of privacy. Nevertheless, she couldn't resist the pull to take a look. She sat on the edge of the bed, Tater happily joining her, offering his belly to be pet. Olivia chose one of the journals, and with a mixture of curiosity and trepidation, she opened it. The entries she found within were deeply disturbing. Her mother had documented her descent into alcoholism in harrowing detail. The entries painted a picture of her feeling like she was losing her memories, of her yearning to stop, to feel healthy again. However, what disturbed Olivia the most was the revelation of how long her mother had been dealing with hallucinations. Her mom's words described the unsettling feeling 
of being watched, the persistent sensation of someone's presence in the house with her. She wrote of her struggles with the constant dread that enveloped her, the ever lingering paranoia that made her question her own sanity. Most heartbreaking of all was her mother's belief that no one believed her, that she was trapped within a reality that no one else could see. In these private pages, her mother had expressed a desperate desire to leave the house, to escape the force that seemed to hold her captive. As Olivia read on, she couldn't help but feel a growing sense of guilt and sorrow for having not understood the true extent of her mother's suffering. Returning to the boxed wine in the fridge as she sorted through the belongings, Olivia continued her work with a sense of melancholy. As the day wore on, the wine began to take its toll, and Olivia, tipsy and weary, settled on the couch to watch a movie. The soothing familiarity of the film lulled her into a nap. However, her slumber was abruptly interrupted by the sound of Tater growling. Startled, Olivia opened her eyes to find a shadowy figure of a woman hovering above her. The woman's eyes were unnaturally cold and dark, devoid of any trace of humanity. Her hair glowed with an eerie red hue, and her shape seemed to envelop the room. Fear gripped Olivia, and she let out a piercing scream as she sat up, Tater barking wildly in response. But as her senses sharpened and the adrenaline coursed through her, Olivia realized that the menacing figure had disappeared. The room was once again empty and it left her bewildered and shaken. None of it made any sense. Had she been dreaming or had the wine played tricks on her already disconcerted mind? Shaking her head to clear her thoughts, she made her way to the kitchen, her hands trembling. Perhaps another glass of wine would help soothe her nerves and bring back a semblance of normalcy. The following morning, Olivia woke up feeling utterly exhausted. She had been plagued by unsettling dreams of the mysterious woman hovering above her. Her own transformation into that same inhuman figure. Her head throbbed relentlessly as she staggered into the kitchen her eyes falling on a forgotten bottle of vodka in a cabinet. She decided to mix a drink, hoping it would take the edge off the events of the past days. In an attempt to clear her head, she repeated her routine of a hot shower and ibuprofen, hoping to shake off the lingering effects of yesterday's wine-fueled endeavors. As she got dressed and wiped the steam in the bathroom mirror, her breath caught in her throat. Reflected in the misty glass was the woman from her dreams, her eyes devoid of humanity. Olivia let out a scream and stumbled back. When she mustered the courage to look again, her own reflection stared back at her, normal and unthreatening. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. Olivia's heart raced as she opened it, finding... Mrs. Jenkins standing there, a look of genuine concern etched on her face. Is everything all right, dear? I heard a scream. She said, her voice laced with worry. Embarrassed and unsure how to explain what she had seen, Olivia replied, Oh, just clearing out some old ghosts from the house. Mrs. Perkins, her expression softening with understanding, said, You know, I never realized how much you look like your mother. Olivia glanced down and realized she must have unknowingly slipped into one of her mother's caftans, holding a glass of wine. Mrs. Perkins continued, her tone gentle. How's the packing going? I don't see it for sign sale yet. Considering her words for a moment, Olivia hesitated before finally saying, You know, I've decided not to sell. I think I'll stay after all. Thanks for camping out with Burnt Marshmallows. Join me every Tuesday for another original story of crime-solving spirits, urban legends, Bigfoot. We've got it all. Happy Halloween, spooky friends. Hi, guys. I'm Courtney, the host of the Book of the Dead podcast. 
a true crime podcast focusing on lesser known crimes and unsolved cases. But today I have for you a different story. The story of a haunting that inspired a movie. This is the story of the haunting in Connecticut. The Snedeker family were like any other family in America. Middle class, comprised of a mom, Karen, her husband, Alan, and their four children, Philip, Bradley, Alan Jr., and Jennifer. Carmen's niece, Tammy, also lived with them. When their son, Philip, was very young, he was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And because of his diagnosis, the Snedekers traveled long distances to the University of Connecticut Hospital for treatment. Obviously, this takes quite a toll on a family, all of that traveling, so they looked for a house closer to the hospital. Soon, they found what looked like the perfect home, a historic building on 208 Meriden Avenue in Southington, Connecticut. It was five bedrooms, two bathrooms, with plenty of space for a large family. So on June 30th, 1986, the Snedekers moved in. Things went well for a while, they moved in with no issue, the children picked their bedrooms, and their belongings were loaded into the house. Everything was fine until Carmen made a very disturbing discovery in the basement of the home. Among the dust and the cobwebs were funerary items, equipment for embalming and other materials that were needed to run a mortuary. Carmen claims that they had no idea that the home was once a funeral parlor that when they toured the home, she couldn't even enter the basement because renovators and contractors had blocked the basement door. The home's owner, Daryl Kern, confirmed that the home was indeed a funeral parlor at one point, a funeral parlor called the Hallahan Funeral Home. And it was in operation for decades prior to becoming a residential building. However, he claims that he did in fact tell the family that it was a funeral home. This revelation did not stop Philip and Bradley from claiming the basement as their own bedroom. They wanted a private space, and this was a big area with plenty of room for the two of them compared to the bedrooms in the upper floors. According to legend, they reportedly slept in the casket room, down the hall from where the embalmings were conducted. But the family would not know peace from the first night that they stayed in their new home. The paranormal activity started almost immediately, as soon as the sun set, and Philip was their primary target. Carmen claimed that Philip would see a young man with long black hair, and this man would talk to Philip every day. Sometimes he would threaten Philip, other times he would stand and watch him, other times he would say his name, terrifying him. Soon enough, however, the activity spread to other family members, and it wasn't just a ghostly apparition watching or speaking to them. Carmen claimed that while she mopped the floor, the water turned into blood and smelled like rotting flesh. But most shocking was the claim that Carmen and Alan had unknown forces assaulting them in the night. And they say that when this started, the apparitions took a deeper interest in Philip. Soon enough, his personality began to change. He was irritable and reckless and cruel, so cruel to his siblings. He locked his brother in a chest and walked away. He would spin his brother Bradley on a gurney over and over again until Bradley begged and begged and begged him to stop. Finally, the attacks from Philip escalated and he attacked Tammy and he was forcibly hospitalized for 45 days, eventually being diagnosed with schizophrenia after he confided in them about the entities that he was seeing. Finally, the Snedekers sent Philip away to live with some relatives and Philip got better. He stopped hearing voices, stopped seeing spirits, but the Snedekers still lived in fear. So they contacted Ed and Lorraine Warren, paranormal investigators, clairvoyants, and demonologists, as well as a priest to do an exorcism in the home. On September 6, 1988, they claim a priest performed an exorcism on the house, and the family reported that the paranormal activity just stopped. After two years in the home, they finally moved out and never returned. But the Roman Catholic Church claims 
that they never once authorized an exorcism to be conducted. The Snedekers went public with their experiences before they even left the home. But Daryl Kern notes that this paranormal activity that they claimed was so rampant only seemed to escalate when the family was behind on their rent. Even their neighbors believed it to be a hoax, claiming that the family was happy whenever they were outside, not the terrified neighbors that they claimed to be. And even Philip's friends said that Philip was quite the storyteller and always had to be the center of attention. Now some people still debate whether or not this story is true, but even if it's not, the story of the haunting in Connecticut and the Snedeker family themselves are part of one of the greatest ghost stories in American history. Hello, my name is Jasmine Castillo, and I am the host of Hands Off My Podcast. My podcast covers ethical true crime cases of people of color and the queer community. And I will be talking about the haunted Docky Lady Bridge in Texas. Now, San Antonio has its very own Anna Mother that hides out under a mysterious country bridge. The old Applewhite Bridge is only about half an hour's drive away south from downtown San Antonio. This bridge is locally known as the Donkey Lady Bridge. It is reported that the Donkey Lady Bridge is haunted by the ghost of a woman who was disfigured in a fire. As such, it has become a local landmark steeped in folklore and urban legend. Located on the outskirts of San Antonio, Texas, this bridge is a source of intrigue and mystery. Her story dates back to at least 1950s, but it could be an even earlier, as far back as the 1800s. However, the versions of the story are largely consistent with only minor in variations. Just like the typical folklore, there are several versions of the legend of the donkey lady. One tells the story of a woman whose husband started a fire in their house. This fire kills their two children and the husband. The wife was left horribly disfigured. The most common version of the legend tells of a woman who lived on a farm with her husband and a donkey. The woman was said to be cruel to the donkey, often beating and neglecting its care. One night, the husband, enraged by his wife's mistreatment of the animal, set fire to the home. The woman was caught in the blaze and was severely burned, her face becoming disfigured beyond recognition. In some of these other versions of the story, her soul merged with that of her domesticated donkey. In others, she is said to have been driven mad by the fire and now roams the area around the bridge attacking anyone who dares to cross it. Legend says that when her physical injuries healed, her face was saggy and her fingers had fused together, making them look like hooves. Thus, she earned the name Donkey Lady. Legend says that she went crazy mourning the deaths of her children and remained in the area of Bear County. She haunts the swampy land near the bridge called the Donkey Lady Bridge. Another spin-off on this folklore is that a traveler started the fire. Allegedly, a wealthy merchant's son was passing by the farm when he began to tease a horse or mule on the, on the property. In response, the animal bit him. He then proceeded to beat the animal until the woman and her husband heard the creature's cries. They ran outside and threw rocks at the son, who ran away shouting that he would get revenge. That night, he returned with an angry mob and set the house ablaze. The woman emerged from the fire. Though many of the details about the donkey ladies are not agreed upon, they all hold the donkey lady haunts the area around Elm Creek and the bridge that runs over Elm Creek. Those who have ventured near the bridge at night have reported hearing strange noises, such as the brain of a donkey or the woman's wails. Some have even claimed to have seen her apparition, a figure with a donkey's head and glowing eyes. According to local lore, if you visit the bridge after dark and call out her name three times, she will appear before your eyes. Although there are no solid proof that this mythical creature exists, many people have reported seeing her in the swampy, overgrown bog surrounding the bridge. Now, if you're brave enough to visit the Donkey Lady Bridge, be sure to do so with caution. 
It is important to be aware of the dangers of trespassing on private property. The bridge is located on a working ranch, and the landowners have been known to call the police on trespassers. Some visitors to the bridge claim to have spotted a person with a donkey's face. Other report finding hoof-like indentations on their car. Many claim to hear the sound of rushing hooves. Some visitors don't claim to see anything on the Donkey Lady Bridge, but they do feel like they're being watched. Most of the stories include damage to their cars, blood on the windshields, and visions of a woman with a deformed head and hoof-like hands. Locals and visitors alike tell these stories. Like this story, the father and his two sons were terrified as they watched the strange creature approach their truck. After quickly gathering their camping gear, the father told his boys to jump in the truck as fast as they could. The creature was now on the windshield, pounding it with its deformed hands and shrieking at them. Reacting quickly, the father slammed on the brakes, which sent the beast flying off of their vehicle. With a sigh of relief, they drove away from this frightening encounter. Eventually, the donkey lady retreated into the woods. When the father and son returned, no one would believe their story until they saw the truck with its broken windshield, dented hood, and scratched paint. The folklore is worth reading about, and the trailheads around the bridge are a lovely visit. Just be aware, if the donkey lady doesn't get you, the ivy, snakes, and feral hogs might. Thank you for joining us for Dark Cast Network's Wicked Week. Join us tomorrow for spooky true crime stories. Again, I'm Gina from Weird True Crime, and this has been a Dark Cast Network production. Come to the dark side. We have cookies.